So like it was said, the last thing that was discussed is that they're breaking down what, what happened to people who now have these special abilities, like how Alex has. And this character, Kincaid, which is one of the people who live in the town, has asked her, has been telling her and explaining her what she what he's learned about this whole apocalypse that started with the people that survived with it. And he even asked her and interrogated her like, okay, well, I told you what I know. Tell me what's up with you. Because obviously something happened to you in order for you to become like this. So that's where we la last left off. My favorite manga is The World on Normal People by Andrew Yang. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to read that book. Uh, there's a whole podcast for free online. Um, and not a podcast, a whole audiobook that someone did for it for free on YouTube. I need to sit down and listen to it when I have time. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 54. Are you okay? Sarah said. She halted as ghosts snuffled around a tree. You've been really quiet all night. Let me turn off this fucking notification. Yeet, nigga, shut up. There we go. There we go. Hi, Laura. What's good? Still love her. I gave her ass my ass bees yesterday, even though I was hungry. I'm weak. Oh. All right. Chapter fifty four. <clears throat> Are you okay? Sarah said. She halted as ghosts snuffled around a tree. You've been really quiet all night. Just tired. Alex hunched her shoulders as the wind forked up a fistful of icy snow and sent it whirling in a sparkling. Ar the fuck does that mean? Arabesque? Arabesque, I think. Arabesque in the light of their torch. She could see the bulky silhouette of their guard a few steps ahead and the flash of snow splintering the harsh white light of his lantern. I'm really sorry about what happened, Sarah said. Happened? Yes. At the courthouse? That's all over town. About how you recognize that man Harlan? Peter told me that Harlan left that little girl alone out there. Ellie. Yeah, Alex said. A little ashamed now, because she's not been thinking about Ellie, but Kincaid. He might call himself a country doctor, but he was sharp enough to guess about the monster. She supposed she could have lied. There was no way Kincaid would, could look inside her brain, after all. But telling him had been kind of a relief. I'm weak to my list. <laughs> Story time. <laughs> Hi, Vic. What's good? What he said about the monster was interesting, too. You don't know that the tumor's gone or dead. Or dormant. Maybe the zap shorted it out. Or maybe all those EMPs organized it somehow. Made it functional instead of destructive. Like another lobe of your brain. Or maybe both. She recalled how sick, chemo sick, she'd felt right after the attacks. She'd assumed the zap caused that, but her brain was chock full of pebbles loaded with a new and experimental drug. Barrett hadn't been able to get the pebbles to dump their payload. The light probes hadn't worked, but light was just a physical form of electromagnetic magnetic radiation, a different kind of EMP. So maybe the zap, from all those EMPs, was strong enough to trigger the pebbles. The monster had either died or altered in some way, and so had she. She could share none of this with Sarah. It's okay. I mean, it's not. I understand why Chris didn't want to go after Ellie, but... She let out a breath that the wind stole. Doesn't make it feel any better. Sarah was quiet as they waited for Ghost to finish. I think they're doing the best they can, she said finally. You know, to give us homes and stuff. That's not the same as being happy or free. People did try to kill you, Sarah pointed out. I'll bet a bunch of people would kill all of us if they could. 
Larry, you're in you're ugh, Larry, <laughs> you're an endangered species. Yeah, but then who'd be left? Lena's right. They need us. I mean, have you seen some of those guys? They're really old. Eventually, they're going to, you know, break down. They need us to take care of them. Well, said Sarah, I don't know if that's the only... There came the sudden distant shudder of gunfire. The shots were very quick, nearly overlapping. Rifles, Alex thought. Ghost flinched, tried to scurry between Alex's legs, and only succeeded in winding his leash around her calves. At the end of the block, she saw their guard hurrying back to them. You girls about done? he asked. His own dog, a long-haired mutt, swished around Alex and then stood patiently as the puppy nipped at the other dog's neck and did the I'm so thrilled to see you squiggle. Who are they shooting at? asked Alex. The guard simultaneously shrugged his shoulders and shook his head. Could be some changed, but they don't bother us much anymore. Ten to one, it's raiders. Nights when they try to come in through the woods. Stupid, you ask me. Why? asked Alex. Because they come out at night too, Sarah said. Double the risk, double your fun, said the guard. Doing the cold man's two-step. Oh, wait, my chest. Ooh, sorry. You mean... All right. Uh, we got our parameter, which means they've got to make it through the zone, avoid the changed, and slip through the perimeter without us catching them. Only way to do that is come out by day, hunger down in the zone, and wait. Once we don't get at night, we get come daylight. Well, that answered the question of the shots Alex had heard that morning. The image of Rubel's guard combing the woods to pick off strays bothered her. She bet Peter wouldn't have a problem with it. Would Chris? Was he out there now? Twice the pride, double the fall? Damn. Deep. So what if he is? She felt a nip of impatience. Who cares what Chris thinks or where he is? Still, the thought nagged at her. And what made her even angrier was that she felt when she pictured Chris taking risks out there in the dark, was worried. Back at the house, Jess was sewing by candlelight and seemed unconcerned. Alex figured she was probably used to the nightly gunfight at the, at the OK Coral. She and Sarah said goodnight to Jess and the guard, who seemed happy enough to thaw out by the wood stove. That dog stays downstairs, Jess said, when Ghost tried following Alex. She handed Alex and Sarah red rubber hot water bottles and a bit water bottles, fuck, <laughs> and a bit and a lit candle, then bent to scoop up the puppy. Oh, aren't you a little brute? She scolded, and then laughed as the dog's of the uh, <laughs> English, English, please. <laughs> Count Dooku from Star Wars. I'm weak. I, I've never... I don't remember shit from Star Wars. I've only remembered like the classics that I watched. That I remember watching. But I don't remember shit. <laughs> Alright. So she said, oh, aren't you a brute? And then she scolded and laughed as the puppy's dog darted from her for her chin. He'll be fine in his bed down here. If you girls want to double up, though, you might be warmer. Uh, said Alex, and glanced at Sarah, who shrugged. It's okay with me, said Sarah. It's okay, take your time, breathe, I'm weak. <laughs> Alright, thank you, Ari. <laughs> Good. You should both stay in Alex's room, then. It's right over the kitchen, said Jess. Pushing through the anvil of cold air, solidly wedged on the stairs, was an act of will. It was so cold. 
Their breath steamed in the light of the single candle Jess had given them. Tori's bedroom door was closed. A towel-covered tray of food was still squared before Lena's door, when she'd come back after her job at the laundry. Alex didn't envy Lena one bit. Lena had gone straight upstairs and refused to come down. Crouching, Sarah peeked under the towel. She hasn't touched it, she whispered. She'll just bite your head off. Come on. She'll eat when she's hungry, Alex hissed back, thinking only of diving beneath the covers. Even with the hot water bottle tucked around her feet, there was no way she was sleeping without socks and long jeans and long johns. Let me see. Double up. Damn, so I was delayed? Say hi, on, stranger. Gonna buy more candy? I'm weak. Take your time, tamales. Yeah, mom, yeah, most of the time when you're on mobile, you're gonna be delayed. Uh, let me see. Sarah lingered a moment longer, then followed. After they'd wash, the icy water gave Alex brain freeze when she brushed her teeth, then swiftly changed and crawled under a double feather quilt. Sarah whispered, She's really not so bad, you know. What? Being in bed with Sarah had dredged up thoughts of Ellie, and Alex had to think a second. Who? Lena? Only if you don't mind permanent PMS. Oh, I thought some I thought y'all said something in chat. <laughs> she had really she had a really rough before. She doesn't talk about it much. Did she really run away from here? Yeah. About three weeks after she got here. She was trying to go back up north. I think she still got family up near Oren. Amish country, she thought. Remembering the sign she'd seen months ago at the Quick Mart. Wow. Like, how old? Old enough to be dead. Young enough to be changed. Her mom's dead for sure. I think her dad died years ago. She said that she... Her mom and a couple brothers were living with her grandparents. They might be alive. Then how'd she end up here if she still had family? I never asked, but I don't think she liked home much. Anyway, when she ran, she only got about a mile into the zone. Zone? The guard had said that too. Yeah, like buffer zone. The cushion between rule and everybody else. The dogs caught her. That's another reason she hates them so much. A mile's still pretty far. That means she had to slip an escort too. Well, she got pretty friendly with the guards. I think she bribed one by, you know. No, I, and then she got it. Oh, that's just gross. Some of these guys are gross, Sarah said matter-of-factly. They only look like grandpas. Anyway, that's why Jess always has to be around when the older guys come in. If a guy our age visits, though, she leaves so we can, you know, talk and stuff. They want us to get to know those guys. What happened to the guard that Lena, you know, they banned him, like they did with that guy you recognized. And people just nicely decide not to sneak back in? I guess when they know they'll be shot, they decide not to. No way. Gotta go, gotta get this haircut. I'll be back if you're still streaming. All right, see you, stranger. I don't know if I'll still be streaming. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> no way. Way. Reverend Yeager's really strict about it. Like, once he decides you're banned, that's it. There are a lot of guards in the woods. Like, walking around? She wasn't sure she wanted to be out there after dark, even with a rifle. Sarah shook her head. Tree stands. You have to know where to look. Even then, they move around so you can't predict where they'll be. You know a lot about this. Oh, well, Peter and I, we talk. The way Sarah said that, Alex thought they maybe did a lot more than just talk. In which case? Tori was in for a major disappointment. 
So what do you have to do to get permission to leave? Asks Alex. Why would, ever, why would anyone want to? Well, Alex said momentarily fl flustered. What if you want to try and find family or something? I mean, if I wanted to. Oh, we'll never get permission. They got us. They're going to keep us. Rule, Alex thought, was like a commercial for an insecticide. Roaches check in, but they don't check out. And you're okay with that? Well, sure, said Sarah. I mean, it's not like we got a ton of choices. That made her think of something. Lena had mentioned that made no sense. Is that what they mean by chosen? Like, is it the same as spared? No. Chosen means that someone picks you. Picks you? Yeah. A pause. A guy. A guy? Yeah, a guy, you know, decides that he wants, you know. <laughs> this is a horrible dialogue. What? Alex said, much louder than she attended. They give us to a guy to go live with them? Yeah, but not with any of the old ones, Sarah said reasonably. They give us to guys our age. One of them picks one of us, and if the council says it's okay, then we go live with them. We get our own house, which is way better than here. Anyway, the idea is we live together and get to know each other. She paused. It's like that old Amish thing, you know? Bundling? Only we get to live together, not just get in the same bed. Neither sounded good. Are you serious? You're serious. Are we- If a guy picks us, do they expect us to, you know, sleep with him? If we want to, I guess. It would be normal. Not right away, of course. Sarah faltered. No one's supposed to force us, but... Sure, I mean, that's what people living together do. No, that's not what... No, that's what people in love do. Even if they lock you in some guy's house, they can't make you feel that way. And they've done this to some girls already? It's only been a couple of months. She felt Sarah nod. I think they were doing it before for a real long time. All I know is no one's asked to go back. The council says you can if you want to, but no one has. I mean, think about it. You get your own house, you make up your own rules. Well, pretty much. It's not like you get to go wherever you want, but it's not safe outside rule anyway, so who cares? My god. No matter what Kincaid said, it was like a cult. So no one has ever refused. Well, I think Lena was worried that this one guy was going to ask. Sarah sighed. It was Peter, okay? I thought Tori liked Peter. Tori, a snort. Peter is so not interested. Greg's got this complete crush on her, though. It's kind of embarrassing, you know? Like a seventh grader asking out a senior. So what happened with Lena and Peter? He started hanging around a lot and asking to walk her places, you know. Like a date? About as close as you get to one in rule. Yeah, I think that's how she figured out which guard was working where. After they brought her back, Peter was so mad. He wanted her banned, but you'd have to be but you'd have to pretty much murder someone for that to happen to one of us. And even then, I'm not sure the Reverend would do it. We're really valuable. What if we say no? Well, I wouldn't say no to Peter, Sarah said. And if you're smart, you won't say no to Chris either. <laughs> what? <laughs> so that was chapter 54. Basically unraveling the whole truth of like what's going on, what would happen to her and why they're not letting her leave the, uh, the community. Cause uh, yeah, they need her to be a baby maker, you know? Gotta, gotta produce the future, yeah? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> what do y'all think of that chapter while I get me a blanket?
All right, I got my blanket. Very intriguing, yes. So now she's gone from a girl who had cancer that was thrown into an apocalypse, taking care of a little girl who then miraculously is able to get assist from a militant to traveling out there after hunkering down in a cabin to getting robbed. Little girl gets kidnapped, militant gets shot, is dying, goes to get help, militant's gone to being in a cult. And in between all of those, she's gone through situations where she's almost fallen to her death. She's gone through situations where she's almost drowned. She's been drowned by other people or monsters or whatever. Not monsters, other people or creatures. Uh, she, let me see, I'm trying to think of other situations she's been in. She almost got eaten multiple times. Uh, she almost got her head blown off. These are all situations that happen in the book. She almost got her head blown off by a shotgun. Um, what else is another one? Oh yeah, she almost got like eaten by a mass zombie mob, like a small zombie mob of like three kids. Um, oh, and she almost got hanged. Yeah, mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And imagine, even before this, she already was dealing with normal life stuff where her parents died in a helicopter a crashing accident and they burned up in flames. Uh, and a year after that, she got cancer, brain cancer that was inoperable. And she lost her sense of smell because the shit started eating up her brain. And she was going to commit suicide when she got up the mountain to spread her parents' ashes at the lake that they used to love hiking at. So uh, she was already going through a lot in her normal life <laughs> before the apocalypse. So, uh, yeah, poor thing. Yikes. And now she's in a situation where she's in a cult where the cult's trying to make her a baby maker. Yikes. <laughs> All right. So that's our situation right now. Chapter 55. <laughs> Sarah fell asleep soon after. Alex stared into the shadows on the ceiling, her brain going like a runaway train. She had been so stupid. How could she not have seen this? This was why people kept saying that she and every other girl was so valuable because a girl could be paired up with a guy hell the way things were going maybe a girl would end up paired with an mate with more than one because they were valuable because they could make babies it really was the end of the world as she had known it rule wasn't a sanctuary it was a prison stress upon stress i can't deal fam and this is just the f first book there's a second book and a third book. By the time I got to the third book, I was having like anxiety. <laughs> anxiety was an issue with this fucking book. I was just like, especially because it was the final book and these life death situations was starting to not be funny. Like, especially because it started expanding because um, it wasn't just Alex now. We were seeing the perspective of more people that we got, got comfortable knowing in the first and second book. They, they spread out to show perspectives of them in the third book. And I didn't finish the third book, mind you. Yo, a bitch was stressed, okay? A bitch was stressed. I could not. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. But Sarah was wrong. Alex had not one, not two, but three choices. One... She could go along with rules and hope that some guy who wasn't totally gross picked her. Maybe Chris, for that matter. Two, she could make some noise. Her father had trained her well. She was easily as good as a shot as any of the guys on patrol, and maybe better, better than some. 
Riding couldn't be that tough. So she could get herself assigned to a patrol. Oh, by the way, Ari, just to let you know, there is other pre-sessions that I saved all the way since the beginning. So if you want to check the whole collection, the whole playlist, there's a link to it. Hours of fun, of stress, and anxiety. Mmm, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, let me see. She did have something to offer, after all. And her super sense. If, say, she told Chris or Peter, would come in handy. She wasn't exactly sure what she'd do if she actually had to shoot someone who wasn't changed. On the other hand, if she ran into another Harlan, that might not be such a problem. Anyway... The point was to get out of rule. Oh, by the way, here's a summary if you didn't see it before. <clears throat> anyway, the point was to get out of rule. So once she'd been on a couple patrols and they loosened up, she could just ride on out and not come back. Three, she could grab her parents' ashes and run like hell, which would as it happened, be pretty much coming full circle, picking up where she'd left off when this whole nightmare started. The first option completely creeped her out. She didn't want to be given away to anyone, and making babies? She couldn't even think about that without her skin getting all crawly. And where would it stop? There was no guarantee she'd end up with anyone she'd even liked. Men made the decisions and rule. Jess was a strong woman. For all Alex knew, there was some of the things Jess wanted. These were some of the things Jess wanted Chris to change. Yet despite all her bluster, Jess bowed to the will of the men. Either way, option one was a complete non-starter. The second option was a possibility. If she got herself assigned to a patrol, ooh, my neck, oh, she could figure the best way out, best way to get the hell out of here. They couldn't keep her glued to one of them forever. Eventually, they would have to trust her. She could picture it. Out on horseback, and one of them, Chris, would say, You check over there. I'll check here. By the time he thought to look for her, she would be gone. So how to get on patrol? She'd have to talk to someone. Peter? Yeah. Peter would liked would like that. Peter would like that she knew guns. Maybe she could even tell him about her spidey senses. Yeah. But how would she demonstrate something like that? Kincaid had believed her because he was one of the awakened, and he knew about Yeager's super sense. But if no one else knew, Kincaid said it was subjective. No way to prove that what she said was the truth, unless she fingered someone. Chris. She didn't know about him. She might be able to work on him, but it wasn't like she was all that experienced. And playing up to Chris made her uneasy. And not just because she didn't want to encourage this whole Tarzan Jane thing. With Peter, what you saw was what you got. Chris lived too much in the shadows, and she had the sense that he was always watching her. Watching for her. Trying to figure her out. And what would Chris do if he knew about her? Bad enough that Kincaid had guessed about the monster. Not even Yeager had put that together. The Rev seemed to accept her ability as an act of God kind of thing. Wow. Wait a minute. If Chris or Peter found out about the monster, she bet either, both, would figure they could trade her for someone who might, you know, live. They'd drop, her, crick her, they'd drop kick her out of town if they knew about the monster. And wasn't that what she wanted? Well, yeah, but not like that. When she left, she wanted it to be on her terms. When she was ready. For that, she would need supplies. Enough for a month, she figured. And that meant MREs, mostly. Three days worth of trail mix and an egg salad sandwich just wouldn't cut it. She'd need bleach to purify water or tablets. 
a sleeping bag, a tarp, water bottles. Her busy mind ticked over the items. Flint, waterproof matches, snare wire, lint for tinder. She would have to make a list. She still had the boot knife Tom had given her. In all the fuss, they overlooked that. She squirreled the knife between her mattress first, then thought that was too obvious, so she hid the knife where she thought no one would think to look. In Ghost's bag of dog food. All the way at the bottom. Just, as, just so long as she kept an eye on his kibble, she was golden. But she would need a gun. Her Glock. If she could find it again, and a rifle would be good. Ammunition, several bricks if she could figure out where they kept all that. Maybe a bow? No, too big. Same thing with a rifle, but a gun for sure. Without question, and a place to hide everything until she got herself on a patrol. But which way to run? Lena. Lena had tried. Lena would know. Would have a rough idea anyway. Yeah, but Lena wasn't stupid. If Alex started nosing around asking questions, Lena would put it together. Lena, Lena would want in. And that was a recipe for a disaster. Once she ran, how long would they try to find her? Maybe only as long as they figured out she was worth keeping. Which brought her around to full disclosure about the monster. And that was no good. Bring her around to door number three. Just cut and run. Soon. If she could lie low for a couple of weeks, playing along while she got stuff together, she might pull it off. No need to get herself put on patrol. In fact, it might be better if she hung around town, figured out its rhythms and who went where, get people to trust her and see her as a familiar figure. The familiar was usually invisible. How many people really noticed everything they saw? Plus, Rule needed supplies. For that, they would need Chris and Peter and a bunch of guys. A bunch of horses, a bunch of wagons, and men to ride as escort, like the old wagon trains. That might be the time to boogie, when a lot of guys were out of town and everyone else was covering their butts. Carefully, she eased out of bed, wincing at every squeak of the bed springs. But Sarah was deep asleep and didn't stir. Crossing to the window, she slid a figure, finger between the curtains and peered out. She heard the soft patter of snow against glass, but saw nothing. And the night was deep and dark and vast, with no street lights or bob of a flashlight, or even a helpful cigarette. She could only guess where the guard kept himself, and he probably moved around, if only to stay warm. All right, I am back. Ooh. Whoa. I need to get a wider um, chair. 
<sighs> these chairs are not big enough for me i want to cross my legs and like not feel like it's kind of constricted because <laughs> my knees my legs are starting to hurt along with my knees with it ah <sighs> all right so i'm gonna lean forward i'm gonna push this back a little bit It occurred to her. Oh wait, hold on. Let me check that you guys can hear me. Cause sometimes I don't know if I, all right, cool. All right. It occurred to her that she didn't know if they had a kind of shelter or guard box, which would make the most sense. Hanging out in a snowstorm couldn't be good for any person even a younger guy her age. And she couldn't imagine some poor schnook hunkering down all night on the porch with a rifle in his lap. It was more likely that there were mounted patrols, like cops in New York City. She would have to find out. And what about the dogs? Crap. If she happened to pass by, and she would, there was no help for that. They would give her away. She was every dog's best friend. Taking ghosts with her was one thing, but having an entire pack? Yeah. But could she use that somehow? She flashed to an image of assembling an army of dogs. Go, fetch, play dead. Not bloody likely, as Aunt Hannah would say. The cold seeped through the glass and broke over her face. She thought of herself out there, alone, struggling through drifts. Even with snowshoes and skis, it would be hard going. Her window of opportunity was closing, and fast. Winter would only get worse. So how to avoid getting caught, or worse, being mistaken for a raider and shot? Maybe duck out the southwest corner and hightail it for the old mine, then loop back north and head to... where? Minnesota, the border. Canada. If Tom was still alive, that's where he'd go. A lot of ground to cover, and a big country besides. But if Tom was alive, if Tom was alive, Tom, she exhaled his name in a soft whisper, watching as her breath fogged in the window, and then slowly cleared, leaving only a memory that there'd been anything here at all. Saying his name brought out, brought on that hollow ache again. If Tom wasn't dead, where was he? What had happened to him? Was he looking for her? No. He'd have given here, he'd, had, he'd have gotten here by now. He knew she was going to rule, but if he was alive, and he was thinking about her at the same moment she was thinking about him. Maybe. She closed her eyes. She forced herself to be very still. Wrestled her thoughts to gray. And yet opened her memory to a smell. That strange and spicy scent that was Tom. She saw and felt him in flashes. Tom in the light of the fire. Tom as he held her the night they found the radio. Tom as a silhouette keeping watch over her. Tom's lips, Tom's hands in her hair, his taste. She didn't know if the tightness in her throat or the fullness in her heart meant that he was there, that they were connected somehow. Maybe all that she saw and felt was the, sen sen the sensual fullness of memory that which abided and was nothing but the ghost of a touch, but the whisper of a word, the lingering of a scent. But she felt him just the same and thought that maybe this, is what, this was why people didn't mind being haunted. Yikes. Oh, damn. So there goes Alex formulating her plan on what to do. Uh, she's going to try and plan to get out. Uh, so we're gonna hop on to chapter 56.
Chapter 56 By morning, she decided that for the time being, she would follow the rules. Recon. That's what Tom would have called it. Work with Wick Kincaid at the hospice, which doubled as Rules Hospital. Learn who went where, get her bearings, gather supplies. And then when the time was right, get herself gone. School was a joke. She was way more advanced than her teachers could handle. And by lunchtime of the first day, the principal figured she might as well spend all her time with Kincaid. Chris was waiting in the hall outside the, the principal's office to escort her to the hospice. He and the principal ex exchanged greetings, and then the principal said, Chris, think you can scare up a few copies of Robinson Crusoe? Say ten? Oh, also Island of the Blue Dolphins. Anything by Cleary or Dahl. As they headed for the front door of the church, Alex said, You can really find those? Probably not. Chris held the door, then followed her out into the cold. The sun was shining for a change. Squinting, he rooted around in a breast pocket, pulling out a pair of aviator sunglasses, and slid them on. Alex felt a quick sting of envy. The sun was bright enough to hurt, and she put a hand to block the glare. He said, You don't have sunglasses? I did, she said, with faint, with faint annoyance. She wasn't stupid. They were in my pack. Sorry, he said. I wasn't criticizing. No big deal. Recon, she thought. So where do you get books? Some in town. But the closest library is three, four days out, so that's not really an option. Too many men and wagons tied up to make it worthwhile. Most of the houses for 20 miles around have been cleaned out already, if they haven't gone up in flames. She unclipped Honey's lead, then swung into the saddle. The snow came halfway to Honey's knees. She would have to trade up for a larger horse soon. Either that or just ski to the hospice which might be a way of getting skis, come to think of it, and maybe a pair of snowshoes. Yeah, I saw that. Burned out houses, I don't get it. Chris guided his bloody bay, night, and fell in alongside as they crossed the village green before taking a side street north towards the hospice. Raiders, mostly. People who take what they can, then torch the rest. They're not as organized or big as we are, or they had taken over rule by now. But what they're doing is kind of an interesting strategy. Why? He regarded her from behind his dark glasses. Burn out more people. They head here. Word gets around. The more people we take in, the farther out we're forced to go to find things. The farther from rule we have to go, the easier we are to pick off. That's why we limit who we take in. But even so, we're taking more risks now than before traveling days sometimes to find what we need. Things might get easier once we can plant again, but until then, we're as dependent as everyone else on what we can scavenge. Is that what happened last night? Raiders tried to get into town? He nodded. We lost three men. What about the Raiders? Got two, but two got away. Next time, I'm following them. I don't care what Peter says. If we could follow them to their camp or town or wherever, we could finish them off and take what they found. One less group to worry about, and more for us. But they're not changed. They're just people trying to survive, Chris, who are trying to take what we've got. If we talked to them, maybe cooperated. There's no talking with these guys. How do you know that? Have you tried? When he didn't reply, she pressed. Chris. You can't just go around killing people and taking what they have. Why not? He kept his shuttered eyes on the road. They'd kill us if they got the chance. The hospice was small. Four wings, 60 beds, and, and only 20 of those occupied by true hospice patients. Most were in the terminal stages of cancer or lung diseases. Minors, a lot of them. Kincaid said as they stopped outside a day room. We're just trying to make them comfortable. 
She swept her eyes over the scatter of patients. Old men, mostly, with portable green oxygen tanks, slumped in overstuffed chairs. Most were dozing, although some played checkers or chess. A few shuffled greasy cards for games in so of solitaire. The sight d depressed her, and the smell of antiseptic soap brought back too many memories, all of them bad. She turned to see Kincaid's eyes on her. You won't be working here much, he said. We got dedicated hospice staff still around for this. It's okay, she said, although she was relieved. She could too easily see herself here, back when the only thing she had to worry about was, oh, eminent death. She visited a few hospices for people her age, and thought that waiting around to die with strangers was even nuttier than waiting around to die at Aunt Hannah's. How are you getting your tanks? The way we get everything. He turned off down the hall, motioning for her to follow. Either the guys out for foraging bring them back, or they don't. Right now, mostly they don't. If it's a choice between our guys grabbing a wagon load of an antibiotics and bandages versus a couple of oxygen, oxygen tanks, oh fuck, it's not a contest. Hold on, I need to get water. Woo! Ah, yes, much needed agua. check the audios <clears throat> what are you going to do when you run out of supplies Alex asked foraging was all well and good but there had to be limits to what they could stockpile judging from the nightly rifle fire Kincaid must see his share of wounded triage Kincaid said briefly like that explains something she knew the word. Her mother had worked the emergency room, but sorting the wounded by category didn't answer anything unless. She stared up at Kincaid. What happens when someone's really, you know, shot up pretty bad? She didn't want to say when someone can't be saved or when someone's going to die. Kincaid held her eyes a moment. If you're smart enough to ask that question, you already know the answer. She did. Chris had said it. When there was only so much to go around, you did the math. <clears throat> Treat the ones who were either most likely to survive or valuable in some way. The rest, you had to hope the end came fast. She wondered if Kincaid helped those people along. Given the situation, she thought he just might. Kincaid had two other assistants both older men in their late sixties who had been nurses but in retirement before. There were six techs, a fancy name for people like her who did things like mop up blood, change seats, oh wait hold on my nose, Woo. all right, all right, a fancy name for people like her who did things like mop up blood, change sheets, empty bedpans, bring meals. When he saw the look on her face, Kincaid laughed. Don't worry. 
When the patrols start coming back, someone's usually hurt. That's where you're going to cut your teeth. Truth to his word, Kincaid had her assist with when a far farmer hump. <laughs> Ooh. Kincaid had her assist when a farmer hobbled in a few hours later. The farmer had laid his thigh open, almost to his knee. Damn, saw jumped and bit me. The wound was very deep, and Kincaid kept her busy, irrigating away blood as he worked. Halfway through, when the bleeding was mostly under control, he'd put in the first few stitches. He handed her the Kelly clamp and tissue forceps and said, You've been watching? Good. Now I want you to throw a couple stitches in the muscle there. Don't be shy. Just do it. He watched as she threw in and tied off the first stitch. And then he nodded. That was good. You done this before? My mom was a doctor. She could hear her mother's voice in her head. Roll your wrist, sweetie. Don't be afraid to take a big bite. We practiced on chicken legs. She said it was the closest to what sewing up people was like. Jeez. Remind me not to come over for dinner, said the farmer. She tagged after King she tagged after Kincaid until well past dark. And when she walked out of the building, Chris was there with honey. Which is only a little freaky. How had he known? It wasn't an, it wasn't as if people could just pick up a cell. Was he keeping tabs on her? If so, that wasn't good. Compared to that morning, they didn't talk much. Nothing more than, hi, how are you? Just peachy, that's good. That was fine. Once they were at Jess's street, a cul-de-sac, he dismounted, waited while she stapled honey in the garage at the end of the block, then walked, to, then walked her to Jess's house. She said goodnight and thanks. He nodded and said nothing, and that was that, which was fine. Chris showed up the second day, but not the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth. Instead, Greg escorted her and pumped her about Tori. Unlike Chris, Greg was both chatty and sloppy, which was how she figured out that supplies, backpacks, food, clothes, were cashed back in the village, and also that the southwest corner was the least heavily patrolled. We even got a couple of gas depots, Greg said. We've been siphoning gases from cars and trucks and stuff. Figured to use it for the tractors, chainsaws, and stuff like that come spring. Why not use the gas now, she asked. Wouldn't some snowmobiles work? Sure, and we would in an emergency, but no one's going to be making any more gasoline for a long, long time. Once we use up our stockpiles, that's it. We might figure a way to pump gas up from the tanks under stations, but we need an engineer to help us with that. Even if we can get at the gas, we still have the problem of eventually running out. And it's kind of spooky anyway, you know? The noise? Anyway, the council's into, the council's into us being self-sufficient and simpler, like the Amish. Which we already kind of were, before the, you know. That's why so many of the houses have hand pumps and stuff for water. Without those, we'd have been completely screwed. With that logic, Alex thought, Peter and Chris and everyone else ought to wear deer skins, give up guns, and take up bows and arrows or clubs. What about the people you turn away? You don't just throw them out with nothing, do you? Jor Greg's forehead crinkled in alarm. Oh no, that would be like, wrong. They get, you know, a backpack and some supplies. A couple days worth of food, water. What about guns? They'll need those too, won't they? Yeah, but... Greg scrunched up his nose. They'd probably shoot us, right? Good point. She inclined her head at his rifle. Nice. It's a Henry, isn't it? Greg beamed. Yeah, it's sweet. Big boy 44 Magnum. The scope is completely awesome. I also got me a Bushmaster M4 for patrol. We got, like, this arsenal. Cool. Where? Well, we all got a couple of guns at home, but most we lock up in the village hall. Down in the basement, below the jail. Keep the ammo there, too. 
It's about the safest place in town. Well, that wasn't good. She couldn't think of a decent excuse that would get her into the basement so she could steal some ammo. Or pass a locked door, for that matter. So that meant she would have to steal a weapon from someone's house. Did Jess have a gun? No. Being a girl? Probably not. One of the guys, then. Or maybe Kincaid. She'd figure it out. She had to. Hiya, Pop-Tart! Welcome to Read and Draw. This must be your first time pulling up at one of these. I usually do these on Saturdays. When I do remember. Here is the summary of the book we are reading called Ashes. Read and Draw is basically a concept where I read a book and when we get to a descriptive or immersive scene, I will draw out the scene in between. If you're interested in checking out all the previous sessions, because we are now in session eight of reading this book, here is the playlist for the other sessions. So you can check them out. Yeah. I'm gonna drink some water real quick. Yeah, because I got tired of having to say the summary every time. So there goes the summary for this book. And once again, if you're interested in checking out the other sessions all the way from the beginning, there goes the playlist. Got to put part seven up in the collection because I forgot to do that. Woo! Giving my throat a breather for a second. All right. Whew. All right. Sunday was church. The council sat in tall chairs, ranged on the pulpit while the rev led worship, early in mid-morning, and everyone attended one service or the other. Of course, Jess had Alex and the other girls go to both, which was a drag. The service was pretty much what she expected. A couple of readings, a bunch of songs, a sermon, more songs, and then go forth and be number numbered among the righteous. Yeager's was mostly brave new world stuff about how much darker than darkness the world could be and how God would permit such suffering, blah blah blah, along with revelations and gall and star wormwood. The Rev also seemed overly fond of brother stories, Jacob and Esau, Ishmael and Isaac, Cain and Abel. For the Rev, the changed bore the mark of Cain. The wickedness of Ishmael, the hard prim pr primitive prim primitiveness of Esau, Cain was a no-brainer, but from what she remembered, Jacob tricked his dad, and Abraham couldn't keep his pants zipped. How many of that reflected on either on either Esau, who was just a hairy, hard-working farmer looking for a meal, or poor Ishmael, whose only crime seemed to have been being born? She didn't know. Judging from the stony look Jess gave the Rev when he started in on his brother's rant, the way her scent, so white and blank, swelled, there was something about brother stories that touched a nerve in her, too. Anyway, Alex tuned out. God and religion had ceased to have much relevance to her a long time back. No one had to tell her about darker than dark. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. It wasn't until nearly two weeks later on a Wednesday that she pushed out of Jess's house to find Chris waiting with honey. Hi, she said, genuinely surprised. I thought Greg was going to be my escort from now on. Too late. She realized how that sounded and added, I mean, I thought you were busy. I was, he said, handing her honey's reins. The slight smile he wore dribbled away. Turning, he jammed on his sunglasses, then swung up onto his blood bay. He peered down at her. Now I'm back. That okay with you? It's fine. Her cheeks heated. But whether from anger or embarrassment, she wasn't sure. 
He said nothing more as she mounted, and they started off, the horse's hooves thudding dully on fresh fallen snow. She waited until they turned out of Jess's street before trying again. So, uh, where were you? Out finding supplies? Uh-huh. Uh, where? Around. He kept his gaze fixed on the road ahead. Up by Orin. Oh. She cast about for something to say. Isn't that pretty far? His shoulders rose and fell in a quick hunch. Not bad. Only a few miles north. She knew Orin, and it was way more than a few miles. You couldn't find what you wanted any closer? He hesitated before answering. She could almost see the wheels turning. I remembered that Orin had this bookmobile. She was confused for a moment, then recalled Chris's conversation with the principal. You went all that way for books? Well, not just books. There was other stuff. Did you find the bookmobile? How many books were left? Everything. As far as I could tell, it was... Chris's voice took on a wistful note. Kind of peaceful, actually. She imagined it would be... A nice, quiet, very big van filled with books. How many books did you bring back? All of them. All of them? That's a lot of wagons. It wasn't so bad. Peter was kind of pissed, but winter's pretty long and there aren't going to be any more books. You don't know that, she said. Maybe we'll write them. He looked at her then. You wanted to be a writer? I hadn't thought about the future much. It helped that it was true. The most future she had was an expiration date. Damn. <laughs> Fuck. Alex is so dark, bro. <laughs> she, she's like, the most I thought of was an expiration date. Damn, have some hope. <laughs> Doc says you're good. Assisting, I mean. That didn't sound like a question, so she said nothing. You ever thought of being a doctor? He asks. For a while. What changed? Oh, you know, she said vaguely. I was keeping my options open. They rode in silence the rest of the way. At the hospice door, Chris said, Hang on a sec. He reached inside his parka and pulled out a slim, rectangular black case. I thought maybe you could use this. She opened the case. Inside was a pair of women's sunglasses. The lightweight plastic frame was sage green, and the lenses were amber. When she looked back up, he'd taken off his own. His dark eyes were suddenly tentative, and his scent was different. Still dark and cool, but with just a touch of something sweet and tart at the same time. Apple? They're sports glasses, he said. The lenses are polarized and shatterproof, so they ought to be good for a long time. They were, she thought. Very expensive. Very nice sunglasses. And the right thing was to take them. To refuse would be mean. Petty. But she didn't want to encourage or like him. All she wanted to figure out was how to get away. Thanks, she said. Then closed the case and held it out but I'm really fine. A silver of hurt arrowed across his face, but was gone in an instant. The scent of apples faded as he took the case from her. Sure, he said. No problem. <laughs> oh, for, poor Chris. <laughs> he said, hey, I was thinking of you while I was out there risking my life. And you know, I saw these nice sunglasses that I think you might like. Not that I'm going to say I like you or anything, but here you go. And she's like, ah, ha, ha, nigga, I'm still coping with grief. I'm not taking this because I'm not staying here. Sorry, you cute, but I, I'm, I'm going to have to say no on that. Like, <laughs> damn. Oh, my God. Let me see. <laughs> so we're, we're already. Damn, these are some long ass fucking chapters. My throat already hurts. 
I don't know. Because there's not a lot of breaks in between where I could actually draw. Let me see. 54, 55, 56, 57, 58. So if I stop at 58, if there's no thing, if there's no breaks, by the time I hit 58, I'm gonna have to stop because I'm not doing 10 chapters reading like this. My, th do you do you hear how rough my throat feels in the back? Uh, that's my throat right now. <clears throat> so if we can't find any breaks between 57, and 58, I'm gonna have to stop right there. So I'm gonna write this down over here or 58 Whew. <clears throat> chapter 57 she was such a complete shit she should have taken the glasses what an idiot when she gave her a second to think about it Chris had ridden into the carnage and chaos beyond rule, gone for miles to bring back books so a bunch of kids would have something to read. In the middle of all that, he thought of her. She could picture she could picture him wandering empty streets, weaving around dead bodies and dead cars, keeping one eye open for the changed or an ambush and the other for the perfect pair of sunglasses for a girl he barely knew and who, with her track record, might just throw them back in his face. Which she'd done. Even if she hadn't needed him for information, being mean just to be mean, that wasn't her at all. Idiot. Kincaid kept her very late, until almost nine. And when she hurried to the front entrance, Chris wasn't there. That was fine, a relief maybe. A relief, really, but this was also the first time he hadn't arranged for someone to wait for her. Maybe a sign that he trusted her to find her way back? No. After this morning, more like a big, screw you, honey. Oh, thank goodness. A tech, Loretta, fluttered up. She was a plump woman with no waist and hair that looked like a pudding bowl trimmed around the edges. Chris wanted me to keep an eye out and let him know when Matt let you go. Except I got busy and I forgot. She felt a little jolt, relief. She felt relieved. And that was even more, that was even more confusing. It was one thing to feel like a shit. It was another to realize that she cared if he was angry at her. He's here? Yes, but Larita put a hand on Alex's arm and dropped her voice to a confidential whisper. He's over in the hospice wing. Let me go get him. I'll go. Alex started down the corridor. Which room? Delmar's. Lorita flittered alongside. Really? It'll only take me a second. You should wait out front. It's okay. Alex was studying name tags. Holter, James, Mitchell. She spotted the right room. The door, with its glass insert was halfway open and candles danced as dim orange flickers reflected on the glass. She felt a warm puff of air from the room's catalytic heater. Okay, good. She could apologize for being an ass. Or, well, think of something. It's right. She fell silent. Her eyes took in the single bed and the man lying there. He was withered and skeletal and looked so dry and desiccated that Alex wouldn't have been surprised if a sudden strong wind was enough to shake his bones to dust. A green nasal canula snaked over his ears and under his jaw. The only reason Alex knew he was still alive was because he blinked every few seconds, like a turtle, slowly and thoroughly. Chris's back was to the door. Mm. Chris's back was to the door. But she saw the book and heard the low murmur of his voice as he read. Something told her to be quiet, to just ease on out of there without Chris noticing, which she did. Loretta waited a few feet from the door and beckoned for her to follow. When they tiptoed halfway down the corridor, Loretta leaned in and whispered, He reads to the very sick ones every night, and he, every night he's in town. 
It gives them something to look forward to. But you won't tell him I told you now, will you? He doesn't like people to know. He's really very private. No problem, said Alex, still dazed. That's why he's always here when I'm done. Welcome back, Tomas. Uh, where am I? It hit her again that there was a lot more to like, even admire, about Chris than she had imagined. We'll just pretend it didn't happen. Good. Loretta looked relieved. Now here's what we'll do. You go on back and make like you just gone out. And I'll wait a few moments and go get him. He usually slips out the side door for the horses. She did what Loretta asked. Perhaps five minutes later, she heard the dull clop of horse hoofs. And then Chris was there. On night, with Honey's reins in one hand. Hi, he said, with about as much enthusiasm as she might muster for a cockroach. It's okay, she said, swinging into Honey's saddle. They rode into silence for a good ten minutes, before she worked up the courage to ask. So, what did you do today? It being dark, she couldn't see his face, but she felt his eyes. Why, he said. Would you even care? Will that shut her up? They didn't speak again. At, at Jess's street, Chris waved to the lantern that was, that was the guard and then said to her, You can get off at Jess. I'll, stay, I'll stable Henny. I can stable my own horse, she said. Fine, he said. Whatever. As they passed Jess's house, she said, Look, this morning... Don't worry about it, he said. No. She reined in honey and turned toward him. There was no moon and she couldn't see she couldn't see his face at all. Please, let me just can we not do this, please? There's nothing you have to say that I want to hear. The words hit like a slap. Then don't listen. But you can't stop me talking, she said. Fine. Knock yourself out. God, you're making it so hard for me to apologize. There was no change in his scent at all. If anything, his shadows got stronger. It doesn't matter. But it does, she said, much more loudly than she intended. Her voice must have carried because she saw the hard white blob of light that was the guard flick their way. She lowered her voice. I was a real asshole. You were being nice and I threw it back into your face. You didn't need to get the books at all, but you did. You could have hightailed it back with just a couple, but you didn't. You found a way to bring back the whole stupid bookmobile. And on top of all that, you remembered I didn't have sunglasses. And you run around that whole town looking for a pair. There are cannibals out there and raiders and people who want to kill us. Kids like you and me and you still risked it, so I'm sorry. Fine. I accept your apology, alright? Now can we please stable, honey? They did so by the light of a Coleman. But Chris did not, as she expected, remove Knight's bridle or lead his horse to a stall. Instead, he remounted, then held out his hand. When she looked up in surprise, he said, Come on, I'll give you a ride back. Without a word, she grabbed his hand and swung up behind him into the cantle. Better hang on, he said. The scent of his darkness had not changed, but when she slid her arms around his waist, she felt the warmth of his back against her chest. They didn't speak during the brief ride back. At Jess's, though, she dismounted and said, Would you like to come inside for a little while? I didn't have dinner, and I bet Tori put back a plate. She's always doing stuff like that. Wouldn't want to eat your food. That's okay, she said. I'm sure there's enough for both of us. Jess opened the door just as Alex stepped up to the small landing outside the kitchen. I thought I heard you out there. Come on in, both of you, before you catch a death. Alex could see the girls were all there, in their robes and slippers. Balls of yarn and a scatter of knitting needles littered the kitchen table. Ghosts capered up to weave around Alex's legs and whimper for attention. Jess, hey Tori, Sarah, Chris said crowding in and after. 
Chris. Alex heard the surprise in Tori's voice, and then saw Tori's eyeballs pinball between her and Chris, and then back again. Jess was just teaching us how to cast on. Cool, he nodded at Lena. Hey. Hey, Lena said. Her normally sour scent did not change. Tori started to rise. Alex, there's a plate in the oven and she knows her way around the kitchen, said Jess, gathering up the yarn and needles. Come on, let's leave these two to their dinner. Hello, said Lena. Obvious. Do you always have to be mean? asked Sarah. <laughs> Not with the ASMR boys. Get out. Don't want to listen. Get out. Chris, would you like some bread to take back to your place? There are a couple of loaves in the pantry. Tori started that way. Let me. Alex can do it, Tori, Jess said. As Lena is so fond of pointing out, she's not a cripple. Alex, there's hot water in that kettle, and Tori made a couple of ni very nice. Cr oh, <laughs> and Tori made a very nice crumble. Apple said Sarah. She was studying Chris. That's your favorite, isn't it? Yeah, said Chris. Uh, thanks, Tori. Come on, everyone. We'll get that fire back up in the front room, Jess said, shooing the other girls out, closing the connecting door to the front room behind them. Beyond, Alice could make out Lena's muffled complaints, and then something sharp from Jess. Her cheeks warmed. I'm sorry, she said. Don't worry about it. Come on, let's eat, he said. She got the food. Tori had left enough to feed a small army. While Chris dug out another plate and silverware, then set about making mugs of herbal tea. As she sliced bread, she said, Chris? Yeah? Thank you for remembering me when you were out there. I... It... She turned around, saw from the set of his back that he was listening. It feels nice that you remembered. There was nothing for a moment, and then, as he turned, she caught a fleeting scent of apples. Actually, he said, you're kind of hard to forget. Hello, Manny. Deadass, I'm weak. <laughs> Not deadass. <laughs> oh. Pop lock could drop my spine. I want to get more water. Whew. All right. <clears throat> Let me check that everything is Gucci. I've been streaming for an hour and a half so far. Bam! <clears throat> it was deja vu all over again. After polishing off dinner and devouring what was left of the crumble, they sipped tea. They sat long enough that Alex heard the creaks overhead and knew that Jess had chased everyone upstairs. She and Chris didn't talk much, which both relieved her and made her crazy. With Tom, conversation just came. Chris was so quiet, yet this was cozy. It was intimate. It was Tom all over again, but it wasn't. Couldn't be. If anything, it was a pale imitation. Like a faded Xerox you've copied about a hundred million times until, until there was just an impression of the original. Tom was Tom and Chris was shadows. No amount of wishing would make Chris into Tom either. And she didn't wish that. Not for a second. Not in a million years. She needed Chris. Pure and simple. She wanted his trust. To make him her ally. That was why she'd invited him in, right? Right? <clears throat> Can I ask you a question? He asked. Breaking into her thoughts. Um, sure she said, pushing out of her slouch. 
Ghost dozed on her lap, his paws twitching. What? Why are you carrying your parents' ashes? When he saw her expression, he said hastily, I mean, you don't have to tell me if it's too personal. No, it's okay, she said. Yeager hadn't even asked that, and of course, Tom hadn't known to begin with. They died a couple of months, a couple of years ago, and they wanted their ashes scattered on Lake Superior. That's all. And it really was all. Come to think of it, no big deal. Why, oh why, hadn't she told Tom when she had the chance? But of course, she knew why. Because then I would have told him about the monster. Once I got started with Tom, there would have been no holding back. And I just didn't want to risk it. I should have trusted him. I held back too long. Oh, was there something special about now? I mean, you could have done it any time, right? It just seemed like the right time, she said, and realized the truth of this. If she had been back at Aunt Hannah's, she would have been trapped in the city, and quite likely, very dead by now. It was as Tom said, it was as... It was as Tom had said, the right place at exactly the right moment. Chris might have heard something in her tone, because his eyes narrowed a bit, but his shadow scent didn't change, and then he shrugged. Okay, I'm sorry you didn't get the chance, but maybe come spring we could go up there, if you want, I mean, I would take you. The fact that she had no intention of being in rule come spring didn't make her hesitate for a second. If he thought she would be there, he and everyone else might chill out. Then she'd find her chance to get away. Thanks. That's really nice of you. She dumped ghosts from her lap, and they gathered up the dishes to wash and dry. More deja vu. All they needed was a little kid hanging around. You're lucky you got something left, Chris said. The ashes, I mean. I don't remember my mom at all. She handed him a plate? She handed him a plate. You don't? He shook his head. She's just this big white spawn. She left when I was really little. Like only a couple months old. To hear my dad gruse about it? She would have booked right out of the hospital if she had the chance. I don't know who she is or where she went. And my dad didn't have any pictures. Do you know why she left? My dad was a drunk. He threw her a tentative glance to, ga to gauge her reaction. He beat her up is what I figure. Will that explain the shadows? Any man mean enough to beat his wife probably didn't spare his fist when it came to his kid either. Is that why you said he wanted you dead? I mean, you didn't say it, but... Yeah, I know what you mean, he sighed. Probably. He had a couple girlfriends. There was this one, Denise... When I was 10, she picked me up from the basketball pra practice. I don't remember why my dad didn't come, but he was probably passed out or something. She was dead drunk, too. I knew as, as soon as I got into the back seat, we'd have had been better, we'd, we'd have been better luck if I had been driving. About a mile from our house, she crashed the car, slammed right into the, into the tree. She wasn't wearing a seatbelt, went through the windshield, of course, that was my fault too. I still have nightmares. There it was again. Nightmares, like her and Tom. That's terrible. Yeah, I heard about it every day. Dreamed about it every night. My parents are both dead now. Thing is, I'm not sorry about either of them. My dad hated me and my mom left. His mouth twisted in a sour grimace. If I could wash my brain and get amnesia, I would. It would be a relief. Bet not, she said. Chapter 58, which I'm now deciding is the last chapter for today because my throat is starting to go rare. <laughs> Woo! <-hoo>. Oh! <sighs> oh! Excuse me. Chapter 58 More snow fell. The weeks melted away, 
and then it was only two days before Christmas. Alex watched as her window of opportunity grew smaller and smaller, contracting as her vision, and then her mind, had when she'd almost died outside the gas station. She didn't give up, not exactly, but with every day that passed, leaving seemed less urgent and more difficult, as if her will was being slowly suffocated under all that snow. And really, was it so bad here? 500 miles was a lot of miles, especially when she didn't know what she was looking for and who she and who was waiting. And with the changed and desperate people out there too, no one was really bothering her. Where exactly did she think she would run into that where exactly did she think she could run to that was safer than where she was? She hadn't totally thrown in, thrown in the towel. She'd gathered things, squirreling them in an old feed bucket that she hung from a joist in the darkest corner of the garage where she stapled honey. Every item she added, a twist of rope, a book of matches, a jar of peanut butter, a scalpel swiped from the hospice and zipped into the lining of her jacket, felt like a triumph, but for only a moment. A flash in the pan like the fizzle of a Roman candle. At this rate, she would be here all winter or until the monster in her brain got tired of playing possum. Well, maybe waiting until spring was a good idea. She didn't want to set out in all the snow, did she? That was just begging for more trouble she didn't need. Her life fell into the rhythm. Work with Kincaid, chores at the house, rides with Chris. They were comfortable with each other. Maybe they were, they, maybe they were even friendly, though they weren't friends. After that night at Jess's, Chris had turtled back into himself, covering himself in shadows, as if embarrassed, afraid he'd said too much. That was all right. She had a few secrets of her own, and she didn't really want to get to know him better. She even understood why. Tom would too. It would be like Tom giving the enemy a face. Do that, and you'd never squeeze the trigger. But she was scared. She was starting to forget Ellie and Tom. At night, as Sarah slept, she would lie still and try to block out the distant crack of rifles and summon up Tom's face, his scent, a flashbulb moment, anything. Yet the harder she tried grabbing hold, the more her memories were like soap bubbles, bursting with every pop of gunfire. She'd have better luck hanging on to a handful of fog. Ellie was only a pink blur. The attempts left her sick and weepy, gnawing the inside of her teeth until her mouth tasted of rust. There was something wrong with her that might have nothing to do with the monster. Where was Alex who grabbed the ashes and run? The one who said to Barrett, I'm calling the shots now. She sure as hell didn't know. So really, maybe Rule was killing her with the promise of safety. She was cowering in the corner just like her bunny rabbit, hoping that no one would notice. Or maybe... She was letting rule infect her, squash her will, who she was and had been, what she could look forward to. She'd never had let the monster get away with that, and there are many ways to fight. So why wasn't she? Because something was changing, again, inside her. She felt it in this slow, general slide into a kind of numb acceptance. Just like when I was diagnosed, it was that stage of anger thing. I was shocked and then I got pissed. And then I fought like hell. And then I went numb. They called it acceptance, but it wasn't. It's what happens when you have only two choices. Live with the monster or kill yourself. Only no one would let you kill yourself. It was a crime, which was stupid. Doctors couldn't help you. They get thrown in jail. She knew, she knew another girl, also a terminal, who'd tried suicide. Pills and Jack Daniels. After they pumped her stomach, they threw the girl in the psych ward because they decided she was depressed. Well, duh. Try living with a monster in your brain and see if you didn't oh, get oh, a little depressed. So there was no choice. Not at all. You, you either lived with a monster, or you, or you did what she'd done. Carpe diem and run. She should run now, winter or not. She should get out before it's too late. 
Sure, she'd probably die out there on her own, but wait too long and she'd be lulled into the belief that all this rule, the life they'd mapped out for her, Chris was her best option. She'd, sub she'd settle for what they wanted. Really, come to think of it, there were two monsters, the one squatting in her brain and rule. Either way, she'd end up just as dead. Run, she told herself. Run, you idiot, run! But she didn't. She couldn't. She just couldn't. God, at least we got somewhere. All right, I'm stopping that right there. What did y'all think of this little session of another a session of Ashes? Very short one of five chapters. But what do y'all think? What do you feel is going on? What do you think this is?